to discover the world and meet new people. Let's go on a bicycle tour. Today we'll take you to the Republic of Uzbekistan in Central Asia. Film and stage actor Yuri Nakamura will ride with us along the Silk Road. It's connected Europe and Asia since ancient times. Rivers are so soothing, aren't they? Her destination is Samarkand, the Blue City. It thrived as a crossroads of Eastern and Western cultures. Everywhere she goes, people welcome her with open arms. She's greeted with hearty traditional cooking, which has become popular all over the world. She also finds something exquisite that originated in this country. Oh. What a wonderful aroma! After more than 20 years of independence from the Soviet Union, what are people here thinking? What are their lives like? Her speedy bike carries her to special encounters along the way. Our 348-kilometer journey is full of surprises you'd never find in a guidebook. Let's begin. Our journey starts at the Uzbek capital, Tashkent. Once a key oasis on the Silk Road. Our traveler is already hunting for bargains from a street vendor. What are these? Pieces of history. He's selling medals and memorial badges from the Soviet era. People used to wear such items with pride. Now they're popular souvenirs of Tashkent. Uzbekistan became independent with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. A statue of Lenin in the square has been replaced by a bronze figure of the people's hero, Timur. I'm heading off to Samarkand. It looks like this. Magnificent! I've never ridden 300 kilometers, but I think I can make it. I'll do my best. This is Yudi's first bike tour. Her destination is the ancient capital, Samarkand, the jewel of the Silk Road. Our 348-kilometer journey begins. Leafy streets abound in an oasis town that's true to its name. Everything is bigger than in Japan. The buildings are huge. The large buildings and wide streets are the results of Soviet-era urban development. It's massive! The buildings are really big! It's Saturday, so the park is bustling with people. Everyone's in a festive mood. Something's caught Yudi's attention. It looks like a wedding dress. There are lots of newlyweds in the park. It's a popular spot for taking photos after wedding ceremonies. Uzbekistan experienced a baby boom after gaining independence from the Soviet Union. 
And now the baby boomers are reaching marrying age. Hello. Yudi's curious about the couples. Congratulations. I'm nervous. You've got a beautiful wife. Yudi has trouble speaking to them. I think it's easier to talk to someone who's not moving. <laughs> Just then, a man who says he's a relative of the groom speaks to her. You can come to the reception. Are you sure? Yes, of course. Her journey has just begun, but she decides to accept his invitation. It's crowded. She looks for a party dress in the downtown market. Mm, very sexy. <laughs> Those would look great on stage. Have I got a dress for you? This is it! You'll be popular with the boys! Why don't you try it on? <laughs> but Yudi chooses a different dress, a style that's popular with young girls. You look great! <laughs> I still think this one is better. I really recommend this. <laughs> She's trying to make me the star attraction. <laughs> at 7 p.m., Yudi arrives at the reception hall. The groom's grandmother greets her. Thank you for coming. Wow, look at this! It was once common to hold weddings in the patio of a family's home. But the popularity of wedding halls like this has surged in recent years. The baby boomer wedding rush has created a whole new industry in Tashkent. Over 500 guests have arrived. It's an Uzbek tradition to invite everyone you know to a wedding and dance through the night. came from Japan. The groom is 28 and the bride is 24. They say people in this country usually marry when they're a lot younger. Congratulations! You look beautiful! Thank you. As soon as Yudi greets the couple, she's pulled into the dancing crowd. Dancing is not quite her thing, but the groom's aunt, Yokto, serves as her escort. You're good! She came all the way from Japan! While Yuri dances, men keep coming up to hand her something. It's money! I'm rich! <laughs> it's a local custom to give gifts of cash to people who liven up weddings. I'm happy you came all the way from Japan. <laughs> I'm just passing through. Is it all right to take so much? Sure, I hope you remember this fondly. <laughs> the very first day of the journey was full of surprises. The following day... Yudi heads for Samarkand, this time for sure. I have a 
great view on my right. Outside Tashkent spreads an unknown world that's not in any guidebook. About 80 kilometers from Tashkent, Yudi sees a crowd under a bridge. I'm Japanese. These are smoked fish. Look at the back. The smoking technique was brought from Russia during the Soviet years. Now the fish are a local specialty. Some people come a long way to buy them. How do they taste? Mm, it's good. Yes. <laughs> it tastes more like mild sausage than fish. We sell these all year round. We make them at night and then sell them here during the day. Every day? Every day. <coughs> the women prepare the fish and sell them here. There's strength behind their beaming smiles. Are these fish from the sea? They are from Sir Darya River. The fish from the Sir Darya are the best. The river is right over there. Yuri goes to check out the river. They're fishing. Dozens of fishing poles line the riverbank. Looks like someone got a bite. <laughs> Any luck? <laughs> You've caught a lot. Look at this. Is it a good catch? Yes, not bad today. <laughs> These men go fishing on weekends. They say it's a good side business. <laughs> the bait is made of breadcrumbs and corn flour. Since corn is expensive, it's put only on the hook. <laughs> Have you been fishing since you were young? For 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's quiet here and the air is fresh. I sometimes lie down while I'm fishing. It's just perfect. <laughs> it sounds great. You've lived in Uzbekistan your whole life and seen the country go through lots of changes. How do you feel about everything that's happened? We can decide what to do with our own lives now. For example, after the country became independent, we started releasing fish into this river. That's why the fishing's so good here. We can spend all day doing what we like. What more could we ask for?
the joy of winning independence has not faded even after more than two decades. Come again! <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, six people in the car. <laughs> she goes back to the old road and heads west. mountain range. A series of mounds suddenly comes into view. There are piles of dirt left over from an irrigation canal project. About 80% of Uzbekistan is desert. Since the Soviet era, large-scale irrigation works have been carried out. people working in a field. <laughs> what are you growing here? Strawberries. Strawberries? I want to take a closer look. May I? They are strawberries. Strawberries are usually grown in greenhouses in Japan. But here, the picking season has begun. In the four hectare field, this man grows strawberries and wheat. The field is irrigated with water from the Sir Darya. You're giving me this? It's fresh. I'm going to have a taste. Thank you. <laughs> the fruit is the result of the river's bounty and the people's hard work. Mm. Go. <laughs> the Murad family has engaged in farming since the Soviet era. The whole family is busy picking and shipping strawberries today. <laughs> They put leaves on the berries to protect them from the heat of the sun. It's farmer's wisdom. You've come a long distance. Thank you for helping. <laughs> The whole family looks like fun. It is, and it supports us. So this is an important business. As long as we have the field, our family can make a living. The family benefits from the gifts of the river and the land. Let's get going. <laughs> It's the third day. Yudi's traveled over 100 kilometers since leaving Tashkent. Yudi trained two months for this journey. And now Uzbekistan is testing her strength with a major challenge. Wind. Uh, 
makes it tough. The straight road extends as far as the eye can see. There's nothing to block the headwind. After riding 30 kilometers against the wind, she arrives at Gulistan at last. It's a town of 70,000 with a flourishing economy based on cotton farming. What are those children doing? The students are buying candy and juice over the fence. It looks like an elementary school. They're cute. <laughs> they said hello in Japanese. The next moment, Yudi is surrounded by children. What a crowd. Some are wearing military uniforms. They say they had a military exercise at school today. How come you know Japanese? Because we watch Oshin on TV. People everywhere watch Oshin. It's a great Japanese drama. I want to see something interesting. Where do you think I should go? The children tell Yuri where to go. Two boys show her the way. This building? It looks like an ordinary building. Yuri receives a warm welcome. This embroidery is spun gold? The children were talking about this traditional embroidery. Everything is handmade. Yuri is allowed to try something on. The embroidery is beautiful. You look great. Thank you. This is gorgeous. A complex piece can take more than a month to finish. Firza and Nigina are embroiderers. The mother and daughter are helping to keep this traditional craft alive. First, they sew the paper pattern to the cloth. Then they make stitches with gold thread following the pattern. <laughs> Yuri gives it a try. I've never done embroidery before. <laughs> Don't worry. You'll learn quickly. It may look easy, but they say it actually takes more than 10 years to learn to make proper stitches. Yuri manages to get the thread through. Mine's bumpy. <laughs> this is your first time. It's all right. It doesn't look like yours at all. Ah, uh, the stitches are uneven. But don't worry. Nigina can fix it just like that. Oh, she fixed it so nice. Maybe I'm not that bad after all. <laughs> Firza, don't you need glasses? 
No, I don't. Members of families who've been embroidery craftsmen for generations all have good eyesight. When we were part of the Soviet Union, most people gave up embroidery. Moscow gave us work, but it mostly involved making insignia for the military. I love embroidery and I'm happy that we can make a living from it. The magnificent traditional craft is still thriving in the small town. That's why the kids take such pride in this embroidery. Next, Yudi is taken to a clothing factory. 25 women work here. The clothing in this factory is custom made. The seamstresses design and make the dresses. Uzbek women love to work. We balance work and life very well. Working outside the home is part of life. Mm. Wonderful. Most women get married in their teens and work outside the home while keeping house. She just got engaged. Are you getting married for love? No, it was arranged. What did you think of him when you first met? He wasn't my type. Well, sometimes love comes gradually. I think so too. Are you married? No. How old are you? 29. You won't find a man if you're past 25. That means it's too late for me in Uzbekistan. <laughs> find the right man and get married right away. <laughs> Encouraged by the powerful women of Uzbekistan, Yuri feels she has to be strong. She pedals on battling the headwind. Day four, Yudi has traveled 200 kilometers and is now entering the hill country. Rivers are so soothing, aren't they? She climbs up a hill to see the view. Look, they're grazing all over the place. <laughs> Amazing.
Mercedes found something interesting along the highway. Hello. They're selling boards? <laughs> what are you selling? Dried melon. Dried melon? <laughs> this is melon? You mean the round thing? Yes, try it. Thanks, I will. Sun-dried melon has provided portable food for travelers since long ago. Let's see. Well, it tastes like melon. <laughs> the sun blesses us with it. Uh, boys, don't stand so close. Yudi arrives at Gizef, a city of 120,000 citizens. I'm hungry. <laughs> She's going to the market to get some food. I wonder what they have. The market continues to flourish in this Silk Road post town. Nan bread is a traditional preserved food of Uzbekistan. It tastes like dried biscuits. What's this? Lime. We use it to cover the walls. <laughs> I talk to one person and everybody starts talking at once. A woman comes up to Yuri as she pushes her bike through the market. Where are you from? From Japan, and I'm traveling around on my bike. Yuri tells her she's going to Samarkand. The woman seems fascinated. Why don't you come to my house and eat with us? <laughs> You don't mind? My family would love to have you. <laughs> Great! Thank you! Nargisa works as a nurse in the city. She'd come shopping on her day off. Nice house! The garden is huge. I'll put my bike here. May I sit here? Beautiful embroidered cushions are piled up in the room. They're for guests. Tea and nuts are always ready on the table to welcome visitors. <laughs> That's a nice custom. <laughs> Nargiza will teach Yudi how to cook a traditional rice dish. First, cut the carrots into strips. <laughs> Oh, look at this. I'm no good. My mom's going to be mad at me. Yudi's having trouble cutting with a round-edged knife. Nargiza's brother helps out. <laughs> He's pretty good. Why are you so good? In Uzbekistan, it's the men who cook for guests. Ah... Uh... Thanks to Farf, the ingredients are ready. Local cottonseed oil is used to stir-fry the ingredients. Mm, that looks good! The oil smells like rapeseed. When the onions, beef and plenty of carrots are cooked, they add rice, salt, and cumin to add aroma, and cook until the rice is ready. About 30 minutes later... Oh, that smells good! It's done! 
Neighbors are lured in by the smell. It's ready! Looks so good! Plof is said to have evolved into pilaf and paella when it reached Europe via the Silk Road. It's full of vegetables. Itadakimasu. We say itadakimasu in Japan. We say bismillah rahmani rahim. I can't say that. Bismillah. Bismillah. Rahmani. Rahmani. Rahim. Rahim. Okay. It's customary to eat directly from the large serving dish. Mm. <laughs> My dream is to visit Japan someday. Please do. When you come, I'll show you around and you can stay at my house. Will you cook for me? Of course I will. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Nargiza sings a traditional song to send Yuri off on her journey. Travelers long ago must have heard this very song as they journeyed on the Silk Road. Lots of people there. What are they saying? <laughs> what? Are they calling us? Shall we go? Would you like some wine? This is a winery. Ah! A winery! It's so big! May I go in? Please, and taste our wine. Great! <laughs> hey, great! You spoke Uzbek! The winery is run by the state. It exports wine to Russia, Kazakhstan, and other countries in Central Asia. Uzbekistan is thought to be one of the places where wine originated. It's been made in the country since before the birth of Christ. The grapevines spread over the ground, following a traditional local method of growing grapes. Yuri is taken to a special room. How beautiful! The lavish room is for tasting wine. The vineyard's wines are displayed on the shelves. It's like a scene from a movie. Some varieties have been made for around 2,500 years. Our wine is very popular overseas. They open a bottle from 1978, a very good year. It's very sweet wine. I'm sure you'll like it. Oh! What an aroma! Mm. I've never smelled wine like this before. Very fruity. It makes me feel like I'm standing in a flower garden. Very sweet! 
The high sugar content of the grapes makes the wine as sweet as a dessert wine. Nurtured by the country's long history and climate, this wine is the pride of Uzbekistan. Come, let's have some more wine. It's raining outside. The wine will warm you up. You're right. <laughs> One more glass won't hurt. <laughs> Uzbek wine will give Yudi the power to tackle the last leg of her journey. On the final day, Yudi will have to go over a punishing mountain range. The first obstacle in her path is a cliff called the Gate of Timur. According to legend, this carved castle wall in the wild is man-made. Genghis Khan's army is said to have stormed along this path to invade the city of Samarkand. It's been one fascinating thing after another. I'm sad the journey is almost over. I'm in love with Uzbekistan. Now Yudi will face her last challenge. She must climb the steep hill for about two kilometers. Yeah. Bring it on! <laughs> Beyond the mountain is Samarkand, the blue city. Samarkand is within reach. <laughs> is this it? <laughs> Are we really here? It must be around here. I'm not going to look until I'm right in front of it. When she opens her eyes, the blue city will be right there. Here I go! Amazing! Yudi is in Registan Square, in the center of Samarkand. For thousands of years, the square has been the starting point of highways that spread throughout Eurasia. The magnificent building was once an Islamic seminary. The majestic blue of the tiles that adorn the buildings is called Samarkand Blue. They're the reason it's known as the Blue City. Islamic teachings prohibit idol worship, but the mosaics depict lions and people, 
they demonstrate the absolute power of the sultans back then. In Samarkand, people from around the world gathered, mingled, traded goods, and accepted each other's cultures. This ancient city is a symbol of peace for the people of Uzbekistan. People's kindness, the closeness, they were so loving. The lady who sat by me throughout the wedding reception, the family in the strawberry field, the men fishing, <laughs> They all accepted me, a stranger, so warmly. to return the kindness someday. I want to be more like them. <laughs> but the warm-hearted people don't leave Yudi alone. You can be my new daughter starting today. <laughs> Throughout her journey of nearly 350 kilometers, Yudi found herself wrapped in the warmth of the people of the Silk Road.